Easter is a celebration of resurrection, of a particular resurrection, of the discovery that where women thought they would see the dead body of their beloved teacher, instead they saw that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. And then as they left bewildered, their teacher joined them, said hello to them, and they realized that he was still alive, that Jesus, though he had been tortured and he had been killed by the Roman authorities, could not, in fact, be killed. Now, religious people make all kinds of meaning and no meaning of that story. Obviously, non-Christian religions don't really talk about it a lot. But when you talk to Christians, they have a variety of beliefs, some in the literal resurrection, that Jesus' body literally came back to life, some in a more metaphorical, you know, Jesus lived on because the women still knew that he was with them. And for Unitarian Universalists, we tend to be more of the latter type of believers in resurrection. We say when people die that we know they live on if we remember them, if we honor their memory and carry them in our hearts. And certainly that's indisputable. But I think practicing resurrection takes a little bit more than just saying, oh, I carry the dead in my heart. So I wanna to talk today about what practicing resurrection means for me. First of all, practicing resurrection means mourning the dead. You know, that's hard enough for me. Believing that people that I love really will die, or even believing that people I love have died is incredibly hard for me. And before something can come back to life from death, it has to die. There has to be the death. Now for me, I don't know about you, but that's not been easy. I shared last year that after my father died, I went to the crematorium and I watched them put his body into that fire to burn. And why did I do that? I wanted to be a witness to his death. I wanted to believe that he had died. And the people at the crematorium warned me that some people got very upset because they in fact thought that their loved person was being burned and it really traumatized them. But when I looked at my father's body, which looked so lifelike, I knew that he was not there. And I needed to know that. I needed to know that he was not in his body anymore. I needed to believe that, that this man who knew me before I was born and who had always been there, in fact, no longer had the physical form in which I had always known him. I needed to believe he was dead. Now, people come to believe that loved ones are dead in different ways. I know some people, when a pet dies, they really want to bury that pet. They really want the body to decompose in the ground. We can't really just do that with people so much. Just put their bodies right in the ground, not in a casket. That's not legal. But there are a lot of traditions where people did send bodies into the elements, you know, before we, we had to get a little more sanitized about it. So the first thing, to practice resurrection is to really see and believe what is dead. And then the second part of resurrection is to have that certainty of the death open up just a little bit of a crack so that the possibility of life comes even with the certainty of death, even with the awareness of the death comes the possibility that maybe that's not the whole story. I don't think most resurrection happens like, kaboom, resurrection. I think it happens when an inkling of an idea comes to us that 
someone or something or a relationship that we had completely given up on, thought was over, and it could be a part of ourself, all of a sudden a little shaft of light comes in that whispers to us, maybe there's more. And the third part of practicing resurrection is what those women did. They believed, they believed that the teacher that they loved was alive. They believed that that shaft of light that whispered maybe was real. They believed that even though it looked like death, there was something they couldn't see. In Minnesota, in the winter, when the snow covers the ground and everything is frozen and dormant, we believe without any evidence in the moment that spring will come again, that life will return. Or perhaps where you are, when it gets so hot you can barely move in the summer and that's the time that growing stops where you are, still you believe that the cooler days will come and growth will come again. We believe it about relationships, where they seem dormant, we see a tiny sprout and we say, I'm going to follow that. And that decision, that is the act of practicing resurrection. It's believing it. It's believing it enough to take a risk for it. It's believing it enough to take a step for it. It's believing it enough even to notice it, to name it. Practicing resurrection is a daily commitment. It's tiny actions. They'll never be in the newspaper. They won't be featured as a grand moment. You never know. One of my favorite resurrection stories that I've experienced is when I was serving as a minister in Roxbury, Massachusetts with people who were primarily very poor, primarily many of them had been in and out of the prison system many times, they were homeless and jobless and they had really hard lives and many of them were wrestling with addictions. And one of them said to me, I don't know if Jesus could turn water to wine, but I know that he turned crack cocaine into a couch because I sit on it in my living room every day. He opened his mind, that addict, to the possibility that healing could come. And in that commitment to follow that light, he found the transformation from death to life, from addiction to a daily life that he could respect, from crack cocaine to a couch. That's how I think resurrection happens in our lives. It's daily. It's not usually poetry. It's more prose. It's not usually lights, cameras, action. It might happen when we're lying in bed early in the morning just reflecting on something. But it matters. Those acts of resurrection matter. I hope that in your life, no matter how challenging your time is, you will always choose to practice resurrection, no matter what the death around you tells you about the impossibility, about the finality, about the end, that you will always look for that tiny bit of life that takes you to a new possibility.